Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Today we're talking about the Dave Farina and Dr. Jim Tour debate that happened over the weekend. I think it was on Friday of last week as of this recording. And I've invited an astrochemist to come on and kind of explain the science of what happened in that debate. If you watched pretty much any amount of that debate, there was a lot of things that went on and a lot of things that happened. But one of the things that happened that probably went over your head was the science. If you're not a chemistry major or you didn't um, major in chemistry or anything like that, there was a lot of like scientific terms and a lot of the science just that was in that debate was over the heads of most of the people that have watched the video. I can't speak for the actual audience that was there because I know that a lot of students of tours were in the audience there. But the point of this video is to, to give you basically a explanation of the science that happened in that debate. So I've invited, uh, as I said, an astrochemist to come on and explain kind of like he's working on a, on a field related to origins of life. And uh, he'll sort of explain all that as we get going. But um, what we wanted to do was just to help you out. And this is also going to help me out because I was it went over my head as well as I was watching it. I'm, I'm more of like the philosophy guy. So um, it, it should be very, very informative for you if you were watching that debate and you were like, what was going on? But in addition to that, it's not only going to explain what happened in that debate. We've got like a 20 minute presentation that Dr. Rimmer is going to give that's going to kind of give like an overview of the current state of things on origin of life. So it's actually going to be beyond just like looking at what happened in that debate. This is actually going to be very helpful for you if you're interested in the question of origins of life. One of the things, let me go ahead and uh, bring Dr. Rimmer in here. One of the things that I like about Paul, he, he's actually been commenting. So he in the, the video that I, I did, the, the interview with uh, Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Jim Tour that we did a couple weeks ago, Paul was in the comments, the live chat, and he was like responding to some of the things that Dr. Tour was saying and some of the things that, that uh, Dr. Craig was saying. And he was kind of giving his like middle of the line perspective. And so one of the things that I like about Paul is that he's not like extreme on either side, kind of like Dave is extreme on the, the origin of life side. And or I don't know if that's the right term, but uh, you, you get what I'm saying. Like Paul, uh, not not Paul, Dave is one of the extremes and then Tour, you could kind of see him as like one of the extremes is like super skeptical of, of the whole origins of life movement currently, the, the current state of the science and everything. But Paul, what's unique about him is that he's, he's sort of in the middle. So he's not like making extreme claims on either side. It's more of a, a balanced approach. And I think that you'll see that through the presentation. And then as we go through the clips, we've got two pretty long clips lined up that we're going to look at some of the things, some of the specific things that were brought up during the debate. And uh, th those clips, I mean, unfortunately, because there was the term I want to use is bickering. There was a lot of like bickering that was happening back and forth. Um, that got in a way in the way of a lot of the science that was actually happening, the, the important scientific ideas that they were actually, that they did get to discuss. A lot of the bickering kind of got in the way of that. So the, the point is, is that the, these clips are actually going to be probably the longest clips that we've done from like a debate or any kind of review or anything. So we're just going to roll with it and, uh, and get through it. But the, the point of this video is not to really address all the rhetorical things that happened and like the accusations and uh, the, the drama side of things. Like this is going to be more on the intellectual side. What was the intellectually or scientifically what happened that was interesting or important in that debate? And uh, Paul, maybe you can kind of uh, speak on this a little bit as we get started here. Were there, a, was it mostly like rhetorical stuff that was happening or, or were there actually substantive issues that they were able to to get to were there many of those or was it more just kind of like mudslinging it was very difficult to get to anything substantive i i would say that there were two maybe three ideas that started to be discussed that were fairly substantive but it got off the rails very quick and it would kind of get off the rails and then on the rails again a little bit and then off the rails again it, it's very hard to pick those out. It, it was hard for me to pick those out. Right. Yeah. There was, there was just so much of like the, the accusations and the tour. I, I'm, I'm not saying that Dave was the only one in the wrong here, but D Jim was, was raising his voice and getting really animated and excited. And uh, by the end of it was just outright yelling. And so th there was a lot of that that was just getting in the way of what could have been, you know, I, I think a lot of us were, were wishing that it was m way more substantive than it actually was. And it turned into this sort of thing where it was like this ego versus this ego. I think 
to, to be sort of charitable to, to Dr. Tour, I think he was the one going into this wanting more to discuss the science. Whereas Dave, I mean, even in his opening statement was more like, I'm here to show you that Dr. Tour is a complete liar. And, a, you know, he's in this apologist and he's, um, he's just a bad character and all these, for all these sorts of reasons. He's a pathological liar was one of these things that one of like two of his prompts or one of his prompts was like explicitly aimed to show that Dr. Tour was, you know, had this bad negative character trait. Anyways, um, it's unfortunate that that was just so, so much of it, but yeah. So, so today what we're going to do again is we're going to actually like bypass as much of that as we can and actually discuss like the important things that went on during that debate, which was the science. And so to kind of like segue into that, as we were kind of developing, like, what do we actually want to talk about for this stream? How can we structure this? Paul was like, well, what if I do like this, this sort of opening where he explains to a lay audience, to like a, just a general audience, some of like the basic science that you need to know regarding origins of life. So we've got this presentation. Again, it's going to have some overlap with the debate, but the presentation is mainly going to be a sort of introduction to origins of life. So this could actually be like, we could cut this out, post that as a separate video and be like, okay, this is a great little, little like introduction to origins of life. Maybe we actually need to do that, Paul. Maybe we could do that separately. But um, okay. <clears throat> th this should be very, very helpful if you're interested in just learning some of the basics and the science of, of origins of life. Again, from, from a sort of middle of the line perspective, this is not e either way. You're not going to get any sort of fireworks either way. So uh, let's start with that. Let's start with the presentation, but stick around because we are going to, we have two clips lined up. We're going to get into the specifics of the debate, explain some of the moves that were going on on either side. Because I mean, it, Dr. Tour. You know, his, if you watch the debate already, which you, watching this, you may not even need to watch the debate because we're going to actually look at like all the, the important stuff. But what Dr. Tour did is he was saying like, you need this, 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 this to have life and you can't get any of these things. So he, that, that was basically his strategy. I've won the debate. But then Dave came in and he's like, well, look, I've got all these papers that show that we can get these things. And so he was the, the back and forth there, though, because it was so technical, it, it was just hard to tell for, from an outsider perspective, someone who's not familiar with the science, who actually had the upper hand here. Were, were, was Dave right that there are these studies and papers that show all these things or, or what, what is the actual like what happened? And so that's hopefully what you're going to see, especially when we get to the clips. But let's start with the the presentation. Again, this is a, about a 20 minute presentation that Dr. Rimmer has has prepared. We're going to get into some of the science. I, I'm going to ask questions as we go along. I, I'm, I'm going to try to stay out. But if I have questions, I mean, chemistry, something I wanted to mention is that <laughs> chemistry, when I was like when I was in high school and stuff, it was like my least favorite subject, apart from maybe like English. I was like, this is not what I want to spend my time thinking about. And so um, I just didn't really pay attention in high school when it came to like chemistry and biology and stuff. So I'm going to do my best to, to, to focus in and, and, and uh, pay attention here for this, uh, this opening presentation, but it, it, don't, don't let me, my, my anti-science proclivities uh, <laughs> get, get in the way of you watching this and really benefiting from this. I'm just saying that I, I've got to really lean in and, and kind of focus in here, but um, I, I'm excited. Let's go ahead and start with the uh, presentation. Take it away when you're ready. All right, Cameron, thanks so much for having me on to discuss this. Uh, it's Oh, I should have I should have introduced you. Why, why don't I give you a chance to just oh, okay. take about take about sixty seconds? I've mentioned that you're an astrochemist, but what does that actually mean? What are the sure. some of the things that you're kind of like working on? And you're over in Cambridge and in, in the UK and everything. So just uh, give a little introduction about yourself for the audience. Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Paul Rimmer. Uh, I am uh, at the University of Cambridge. I'm a professor there in the Department of Physics. I do experimental astrophysics, but I'm trained as an astrochemist, and an astrochemist is someone who looks at chemistry in space, in the interstellar medium, uh, disks around uh, uh, stars, and I also look at the chemistry in planetary atmospheres and in aqueous uh, systems on planetary surfaces, but very much from the perspective of the whole planetary system and the star-planet interactions. I do work on origins of life. That's one of the two main things that I work on. I've uh, published uh, more than a dozen papers in origins, and I've been recognized for that. Um, 
but I'm not an organic chemist. I'm not a synthetic chemist. I actually agree with Jim Tour that that's, that's the sort of center part, at least of the first part of the problem. Uh, but there are other parts that intersect and astrochemistry is one of them. So, uh, all right, sorry. I was, I, I was, uh, I was trying to switch screens, switch scenes and I couldn't figure out which one I needed to switch to, but we're, we should be all set now. So, uh, feel free okay, to go great. ahead and start the, uh, the intro or the, uh, the presentation here. All right. Like I said, thank you very much, Cameron, for, for having me on here to discuss this. Uh, it always fascinates me how, how so many people are, are really, really interested in this particular question. Um, I'm, certainly very interested. I think this is one of the most interesting questions in science right now. Um, and uh, I thought it would be good to introduce it. And in part, because any sort of clip from this debate, unfortunately, didn't really have an introduction into how Oris and Origins research works. So first, I'm going to start with a little philosophical aside. Um, this is a sort of philosophical uh, position that I take when going into science. And that's uh, First off, I'm a Christian. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, I believe that God created the physical universe and set it up in such a way that no matter who does an experiment, no matter what beliefs they bring to the experiment, if they set it up the same way and run it the same way, they'll get the same results. So if a Christian does an experiment or a Muslim does an experiment or a Jew or an atheist, they will all get the same results. Um, experiments and observations are what's really important for testing with science. That's really what science is about. And so this is a sort of equalizer for people from different views. Now, people with these different beliefs will interpret results differently, and they may ask different questions and imagine different kinds of theories and models, and that's good. We want a diverse group of ideas because the ideas that we have right now aren't good enough to solve a lot of these big questions. Um, now, you might disagree with me about that. And if you do, uh, you can save time and just say, well, you know, if, if you happen not to be a Christian, you can say, well, he is a Christian and therefore unreliable on this. And then you can save some time in watching this. Um, uh, but if you do have that position and want to get into science, especially something like origins of life, you're going to have a very hard time because you will end up working with Christians and Jews and Muslims and atheists. And uh, not only that, but um, it turns out that the sort of beliefs that you bring in, even if they're not religious beliefs, if they're just beliefs about things that science hasn't settled yet, uh, those sorts of things, there can be a wide variety. And if you choose who you're going to trust and who you're going to work with on the basis of that, it's going to be a very small group. And so I thought I would start with some quotes from certain researchers who are connected with origins or involved with it in some way. Um, and there we go. So I'm going to start with this particular quote. The origin of life field as a whole is unconvincing, generating results in toy domains that cannot be scaled to any real world scenario. That's a pretty negative view on origins. And that comes from William Baines uh, in this particular paper. And William Baines is an atheist. He's also one of the world leading astrobiologists out there. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure to work with him, even though we very much disagree about origins. I think this also emphasizes that your position and skepticism on origins doesn't necessarily um, uh, connect with your religious beliefs or lack thereof. We can look at another view. Um, origins of life models are based on that are based on energized assemblages of building blocks are untenable in principle. We contend that hardly anything could be less compatible with the uh, general inner workings of life, much less its emergence, than the results of exposing any mix of molecules to any sort of chemically nonspecific energy, whether stably or episodically, that one can find among the inevitable myriad of organic products of such experiments and processes, some of the building blocks of life is utterly irrelevant and misleading. Um, that's actually stated by uh, Albert Branscombe and Mike Russell. Mike Russell. Uh, uh, helped start the hydrothermal vents hypothesis. So an active origins research who is very optimistic about origins, but would be very pessimistic, as pessimistic as Jim Tour was of all the research Dave produced. He would have said that it that all these would be untenable in principle. Um, 
Viewed in this way, prebiotic synthesis of building blocks, to which we have devoted so much of our time, only corresponds to a small increase in the complexity of the system and no increase in its aliveness, a humbling thought. This is John Sutherland, and probably because uh, um, uh, uh, I learned a lot about this field from John Sutherland, uh, I'm informed by that. This is probably closest to where I happen to be as well. And it comes from a wonderful paper about uh, studies on origins of life, the end of the beginning. I recommend looking into that if you're really, really interested. Here's another one. If you start with hydrogen cyanide and you mix together small sulfur bear bearing molecules in water, you end up with all the building blocks of life as it exists today. More positive view. That's Karen Oberg. So maybe if you were big on origins of life, you'd like to work with her. But um, as it turns out, she is a uh, practicing Catholic, and uh, maybe her Catholic views influence the way that she does science too much for you. Finally, uh, here's the most optimistic view that I could find. You start with a random clump of atoms, you shine some light on it for long enough, it should not be so surprising that you get a plant. And uh, that comes from Jeremy England, uh, who is uh, a Jewish rabbi. So now that I've given that sort of view, um, I'll go into the sort of approach about origins of life. And Cameron, I really do encourage you to, to ask questions. In fact, I'll be asking you a couple questions through this. Oh, great. Um, OK. Well. Yeah, cool. So first, I'm going to start with what is life. I actually think this is not a good scientific question, at least not yet. I think this is a philosophical question and an important one for informing how we do this. And I present um, this really nice book by a a philosopher, a professional philosopher out of University of Colorado, Carol Cleland, who wrote a book about why we shouldn't worry about what the definition is yet. She builds a philosophical case that I find mostly compelling, but I would encourage uh, the, the, the philosophers viewing this to dig into that. Fortunately, I don't think we really need to answer that to start digging into origins. What we really need to ask is, what does life do? I'm going to give first the the sort of physics perspective. So life we can look at uh, in a sort of general unit of the cell. And the cell will take energy in and release heat. And it does so um, in a way that is very, very good at generating entropy. And it has this really fascinating, bizarre property that it makes copies of itself. And, the, and this is connected, actually, to the generation of entropy. This is one of the reasons why the system is physically stable for so long and can propagate and even sustain and restore itself is because it's so much better at generating entropy if you can make copies of yourself. If you're already far from equilibrium, uh, then replication will increase entropy so much more and will help you get uh, back to equilibrium that much faster. And these are ideas that have been explored by Jeremy England um, in uh, a paper about the statistical physics of, uh, of replication and a great book called Every Life is on Fire, How Thermodynamics Explains the Origins of Living Things. Well, that's good and all. And maybe that says that um, if somehow you could have a far from equilibrium system and wait long enough or have enough of them, an infinite enough number of them, these sorts of self-replicating complex systems would eventually arise. But because it's hard to imagine these just coming together just by themselves in a very likely way, um, it's difficult to see how you would exactly get to this state, even if this is a state that under certain circumstances is thermodynamically favorable. And so when I say it's complex, let's look at how complex it actually is. Here's the first slide. Many of these slides are actually more meant to uh, to intimidate rather than to express understanding, except just to express understanding that life is complicated. Um, so this yeah, because this one, aspect. this one, I mean, on the screen here, like I don't even think that people can read like all the the words that are that are on this. It's yeah. so small. I wouldn't worry too much about that, except just to describe the sort of idea of this is that what this is doing is this is a cycling through of three carbon, four carbon, five carbon, six carbon um, molecules. And basically what it's doing is either it can run one way or the other. Uh, in one way, what it does is it takes energy and it builds all of the building blocks that life is made out of. You can also run it the other way. Um, and uh, uh, it can take uh, molecules and break them apart and get energy that it can store. And even this, you might say, well, this looks relatively simple. Um, 
a little complicated and maybe a little difficult to imagine how all these reactions would work without enzymes, without something that could help move these reactions forward. But they can't just work by themselves. They actually have to make those molecules. And so you actually need to extend the network. This is what uh, Wu and Sutherland have proposed as the minimum network that you would need for doing this. This is a lot more complex. But this might get you um, all of the different building blocks and ways to hook them together running this sort of chemical energy cycle. But maybe this is too simplistic. No one's actually done this in a lab or anything. This is just a hypothesis about uh, the sort of minimum set of reactions. The actual answer is probably somewhere between this. Oh, and there's our citric acid cycle again. It's still there. And this. And this is uh, mm. uh, the, uh, the method for building these for E. coli. Um, and would be very similar for LUCA. LUCA means last universal common ancestor. Wait, what is and, what, 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 what am I looking at? This is this is the, <laughs> the map that you need in order to, to get e, e. coli, is that what you said? Yeah, so this is Is this from um, the atomic level or are we built are we like going from is, atoms to So this would actually take in um, uh, uh, a particular chemical energy source. So you could imagine, for example, in LUCA, the way that this might work is that um, there would be What a, is LUCA? Uh, last universal common ancestor. So oh, okay. uh, that's uh, that's what we are all related to uh, when when you talk about it from from uh, from the Darwinian perspective of uh, uh, um, all life has uh, has a, a common ancestor. This mm -hmm. is the last universal common ancestor. So Luca, it's as it's as far back as we can get using our knowledge of biology and genetics. Before that, we don't know. Okay. And all, you know. Already right at that, quote, simple life, things have gotten, as you can see, incredibly complicated. Um, what this really represents is uh, uh, Luca might have gotten its energy by um, a gradient of charge across its, its, uh, its cellular membrane. And it would have used a molecular machine called ATPase, which rotates based on that energy gradient and would have put together what's called adenosine triphosphate, a particular energetic molecule. And then it can break that molecule apart and then build um, all of the building blocks for DNA, RNA, proteins, the membranes themselves, allow for cell division, everything else. And this is just a metabolic picture. This is just showing how that energy works out to getting to all the places that build this. This does not represent the entire complexity of the cell by far. This just represents that sort of energetic network, this series of chemical reactions that have to happen in a certain sequence for those things to take place. Mm. But so the, so the idea is that, though that, that if you've got all the building blocks and you have enough time that eventually this is going to happen. Yeah, that's the, uh, so um, uh, you <laughs> you certainly would not, and this will be relevant in about a slide or two, um, because I'm really glad that you brought that up. You certainly would not expect this to happen in a single step. You would expect there to be a lot of stable steps going mm -hmm. up to something mm -hmm. like this. But it's a scientifically respectable idea that maybe this did in fact happen in a single step. It's not an idea that I accept, but uh, um, that is an idea that uh, was uh, put forward. And here you have degree of aliveness versus time. Bam, you just get aliveness. You just take a bunch of chemicals, throw them together. Something as complicated as Luca pops out. Wait a second. And, the, the title of this, How Did Life That Does That Begin? What is, what is, is that? Oh, is how that did the sort of life that... <laughs> that uses this energy. It's a kind of sloppy title. I apologize. Oh, okay. For it. So this is the picture promoted um, uh, by Jacques Minot in Chance and Necessity in 1971. His sort of picture is that it really was just a chance occurrence, um, kind of like the 747 that comes out of the junkyard with the tornado. And on this basis, he thinks we're probably alone in the universe, probably wouldn't have happened anywhere else. So unlikely. And in addition, it's useless to study in the lab because we'll never be able to reproduce those sorts of conditions again. We just have to stick with life as almost sort of a brute fact and move on from there. Uh, Jacques Minaud, uh, uh, um, uh, founder of molecular biology, one of the founders of molecular biology, one of the great scientists 
of the past, but really did hold to this sort of view. If you do hold to this sort of view, you probably won't start working in Origins. Um, You're making me super life... skeptical of, of Origins of Life research already in, in a matter of like three or four slides. <laughs> All right. Well, here, here we are. I'm why, sure I'm not the only one watching this. Like... Do this. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, it is a very hard problem. And, yeah. um, well, I'm and, seeing that now. But one of the pictures that you kind of have to take of this, if you do think it's solvable, is that there are these, um, there are these points of uh, um, uh, stable systems that are a little bit more complex than the one before that will eventually get you to something like um, a self-replicating system capable of Darwinian evolution, which will be way, way simpler even than that last universal common ancestor. The protocell, whatever it is, will have to be much, much simpler. And this is a slide from John Sutherland's um, opinion paper. He kind of emphasizes this is probably the current state of the field. <laughs> and uh, we are a very long, long way from anything like Luca. Uh, the way that he described it to me once is, it's like the difference between standing on, uh, on the second story of a building to the first story versus the first story in the center of the earth. This is a very, very long way. But once you get to that, replicating system, then you can start to invoke some of the uh, some of the real potential for Darwinian evolution to take over. And that's where I would stop talking very much and uh, pass it over to someone like uh, like Seigart uh, to talk about what potential there would be there. But even that is a long, long way to go. One of the misleading things about this picture is that we've only done that little bit of the beginning work. We've actually done a little bit of work all along potential paths to get there. But there are these very short segments, and it's very hard to see right now, since they're such small segments, how those segments would link together. There's some signs about that recently with some, with some real accelerating developments in this field, but it's still not clear enough how these different things uh, work together. There are people who are taking pieces out of cells, trying to put some of this prebiotic chemistry in cells to see how they work. Yeah. There are some people who work on these sorts of middle of the uh, uh, range sort of metabolic systems or ribozymes, these uh, RNA made molecular machines that can do some of this. And that's kind of somewhere in the middle here. And then the sort of stuff that I do is right at the beginning, just taking simple molecules and uh, seeing under what circumstances they can develop into some of the building blocks of the building blocks of life. This actually looks, it reminds me of at one point during the debate, maybe something else that I listened to from from two is that he he does think that we need basically like a sort of revolution or something something major to happen that's going to take us from where we are in our state of ignorance to the the sort of next level i see that as like i want to point to the screen but that's not going to help the audience where it says major system innovation i yes. suppose that's where like we're expecting to have someone like an albert einstein come in in the, mm -hmm. the origins of life community to, yeah. to to shake things up and and propose a completely new crazy way of of thinking and then we're going to get to the next step, next level. Still not going to have everything figured out at that level, but then it's just going to mm -hmm. kind of go as we as yeah. we wait for for new brilliant minds to come along. Yeah, no, uh, um, I I think that that's very close to to what um, John Sutherland is trying to suggest in this picture. Is that it's not even just one major system innovation, but it's multiple. And mm -hmm. um, one of the big ones um, that a lot of people are working on right now um, is the origin of the genetic code. That would certainly be a major system innovation. Uh, there's some really interesting progress in that, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is much more catered to a much earlier stage, which is much more uh, what uh, what the debate was concentrating on. Yeah, well, what about Tour's claim that the target is moving further away? He mentioned this a couple times during the debate as well. Reason I know all this is because I unfortunately had to watch the debate several times before we we filmed this. Uh, My condolences. But um, yeah, one one of his claims is that the the reason why we're we're not only clueless about the current state of things, but we're also going like what's making it more difficult is that the more that we learn about the cell, the more that we learn about the building blocks of life becomes more like the target is moving away from us. And so that's why he thinks it's like, it's not only unlikely that we're going to figure it out soon, but it's because, well, it's, it's even more unlikely that we're going to figure it out soon because we're learning mm -hmm. more and more. Is that, do you, do you agree with that? Is that like what you would say is, is true of the state of things as well? I agree with that in a sense. We are learning more and that does change the goalpost. Um, 
But I would say that that's true in every scientific field where the more questions you answer, the more questions you find. So once you get an answer to one question, you find 10 more that need answering. So mm -hmm. in that sense, there's always something more to explore. That's true in planet formation, for example, or star formation. There are a lot of questions involving magnetic fields that never arose before because even the simple model wasn't worked out yet. Um, I don't think that this will all will ever be a resolved field in that sense. I don't think any scientific field ever gets completely resolved in that sense. We're always learning more. Um, the one place where I would disagree is I, the picture is starting to become clearer. You can almost imagine this as a sort of uh, island um, of knowledge in a, uh, you know, surrounded by a sort of sea of, of ignorance. And the sea is very, very foggy. And we could barely see just a couple rocks, uh, say, in the 1950s. Now we can actually see a little bit of the shoreline. The more that we find of the island, the more sea we're going to find. So the more that we know, the more unknown we find. But we really are making progress. And in fact, finding that more unknown is a sign that we are, in fact, getting closer. All right. Yeah, feel free to continue. Sure. So we have this awkward title. This is the sort of <laughs> thing of uh, we just don't know how life started. Okay, okay. Now I now I, I understand the title. I wasn't understanding. How did life that does that begin? Okay. Yes. I was reading it like it Maybe just didn't make sense. some life that does other sorts of things besides yeah. the sort yeah, yeah, of metabolism yeah. that we're mm -hmm. used to. And, and I'm not even going to try to talk about that. Um, so I break this down into three sort of steps. Um, this involves work that uh, um, I've... I, I've published, this is my way of thinking about it, is uh, you start with some initial conditions. Does the environment invoked by a scenario, and a scenario is just a series of chemical reactions or uh, some sort of chemical network or something that needs to take place to change where you started to where you end. So does the environment invoked by the scenario provide necessary initial conditions for those reactions to take place? The sequence of reactions. What is the probability that those reactions will take place in sequence and unaided in this environment? And then the outcome. How likely is this outcome of the reactions will result in a protocell? And probably a simpler question is uh, what paths are opened up for the chemical process? What paths are closed off? What potential do we see for extending this chemistry further? And so um, when we do this, we want to talk about this, uh, what I call a prebiotic inventory. Um, and this is a sort of uh, um, uh, intermediate step along the way. So this is just getting to these sorts of building blocks. And I'm concentrating on this because the debate concentrated on this. So life needs four things in this uh, high level view. We need that metabolism. These reactions will not happen just by themselves, not certainly not quickly enough to produce anything, uh, anything useful. So you need uh, molecules that control the speed of those reactions. Uh, generally, those are done by proteins, which are made out of amino acids. You also need some way to store information that gets copied when the cell uh, um, uh, uh, um, divides Duplicates, and replicates. replicates. Yep. And uh, you also need information on how to build these molecules that control the speed of the chemistry. And this is done by DNA and RNA, which are made up of ribonucleotides. And then you need to have some way to contain it. And these are contained by cell membranes, which are made up of phospholipids. So now I'm going to get to your uh, now. Now I'm going to ask you a question, Cameron. Uh, what features, okay. what sort of reactive features would you choose for the molecules of life? And what I mean by this is how reactive do you think these sorts of uh, it's kind of like Legos that you have to hook together. You have each of your Legos. How reactive do you want each of those Legos to be? Define reactive. So reactive is how likely are they to click together into something else? How likely are they to hook together? Mm, I I don't know because I mean when I when I think about Legos, Legos don't just click themselves together. There's got to be someone doing it. So, yeah, but you so could like, make what those was Legos. The maybe so they're, like maybe they are magnetic or something. You could imagine that maybe you have magnetic Legos that can hook themselves together. And they together. got tossed around in, a, in like a blender or something. Not a blender, yeah. but like a whirlpool or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas so, you could have different so, Legos, different molecules that aren't reactive, like regular yeah. Legos. Oh, that don't have, like don't have a magnetic. Okay. Um, yeah. And then what is the prob? what was the question? What is the probability that that would? Oh, that no, there's would a, uh, um, uh, which, which of those would you choose if you were trying to build something more complex? Oh, uh, the ones that are reactive. 
Yeah, so you would naturally choose the ones that are reactive um, because the ones that are inert won't do anything. So the ones that are yeah, reactive, yeah. But, but the problem there is then they're just going to click together everywhere and you just get a huge mess. Mm. Um, so what would you want to change if you could about their reactivity to make sure? Oh, that they I see. What you want. Yeah, yeah. So you would have to, you'd have to have some sort of like plan for like okay so like the yellow bricks would have to collect connect with the green bricks and they wouldn't yeah. connect with the red bricks so it wouldn't just be like mag uh magnetism it'd have to be like something specific that connects just the yellow and the green together absolutely you want them to connect when you want them to and not when you don't yeah that's exactly right and amazingly and i think this is just so astounding this is how the chemistry that connects these things actually works so first we'll talk about an amino acid. This is a picture of an amino acid. Carbon is C, oxygen is O, hydrogen is H. We'll get to the R1 in just a second. Nitrogen is N. This is the N-terminus. This is an amine, NH2. You also have a carboxylate or carboxylic acid, the C-terminus. And all amino acids, uh, all 20 of them built exactly the same way in this respect. This R is just whatever the side chain is. It's some extra molecules that make that amino acid its own kind. And the different ways you link those together determine how those amino acids, when they're all linked together, will fold up and what sort of chemical properties they will have. Hmm. Yeah, I remember I remember them talking about side chain a couple of times. We will get a but little maybe... bit more into that after the clip, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's helpful. So what happens here is that OH from that carboxylate or the carboxylic acid group and the H from the amine group can attract together and link together. There's our magnet. And mm. when you put OH and H together, you get H2O. It's water. Beautiful. And you build what's called a peptide bond. And so now you have your dipeptide and water. But chemistry like this takes place in water. So it favors actually doing the opposite, breaking this apart into two separate amino acids and not combining them. When you try to do this in water, it just doesn't happen. If you happen to have a molecular machine like the ribosome, um, uh, it actually has molecules that grab these together, remove the rest of the water out of the way of here to allow them to link the way that they're supposed to, and then throw them back into the water where they're relatively stable. Eventually the water does break them down. But what this means is these things just bounce off each other um, until you want them to react. So this is exactly the way that we want our Lego pieces to work. And I just find but that- But then you've got to have something cool. to get them to react and connect. Yes. So let's say that you didn't have that and you know that this is what happens when you have lots of water. What's the first mm -hmm. thing that you would think about to try, maybe your first prebiotic chemistry experiment, Cameron, what's the first thing that you would try if you had some of these amino acids to try to get them to react? When you don't have those put them on up. clay yes you dry them out that's why this how did i know works. that because clay was out. mentioned in the debate <laughs> <laughs> yeah well lots of people try lots of different surfaces some work better than others because some of them have chemical properties that help guide these things in a little bit better way and some of them are worse well and then clay so, would have been available in the early prebiotic earth right yeah, the, there would have been clays and there would have been um, uh, lots of different kinds of rocks and maybe some some uh, kinds of metallic surfaces and various other things. And so lots of people try lots of different things by saying, well, even if it's a rare surface, maybe all you need is one surface. And then, you know, you kind of let the imagination go in that in that respect. But drying yeah. it out was one of the first things that people thought of because you just look at the chemistry and that seems like a natural way to try to do this. Lots of mm -hmm. prebiotic chemists talk about wet, dry cycles, freeze thaw cycles. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah. All right. So I'm actually tracking. I'm, I'm surprised. Great. I'm, surprised. I'm glad you're doing a great job. Thanks. So <laughs> those aren't the only molecules that we need. Uh, we also need nucleotides and nucleotides have three parts. Um, you have the phosphate, which is those peas that have the little yellow circles around them. And then you have the sugars, which are the um, little orange uh, uh, pentagon shaped things. Mm -hmm. And then you have your bases, adenine, thiamine, guanine, and cytosine. And those are the different colored things, the greens and the purples um, and the reds. And, um, and so 
the greens, purples, and reds are called the nucleobases. When they're connected with that sugar, they're called nucleosides. And when they're connected with a the phosphate, they're called nucleotides. And the phosphates help hold these things together in the right shape so that they can have those very weak bonds, um, those Watson-Crick base pairing bonds so that they can hold together so that new information can be copied from whatever template you happen to have. Um, and yeah, the phosphate just holds it together in the right shape. And that will be a very important thing for one of the clips too. And here's one of the astounding things. This is a great paper um, at 1976. It's a bit of an old paper, but it's a wonderful paper to talk about this kind of chemistry and a lot of what's still motivating certain aspects of origins. So we have adenine, one of the bases, ribose, that's the sugar. You can see the H in one place and the OH in another. The OH is at the top end of the ribose and the H is at that nitrogen um, on the adenine. I should have put little circles on this, but the main thing that you can see is that water's taken away. That OH and H connect, they go away, and this joins. So we're getting rid of water again. It's the same principle as with the amino acids. But then we still need to add our phosphate. That is also a dehydration reaction. That's also a reaction that removes water. The OH and the H combine, and you get your um, adenosine phosphate. And then let's say we actually want to take two of these and put them together. So we want to create what's called that phosphodiester bond. That just means the, uh, um, the, the OPO thing that's there. And we want that to connect. That's also a dehydration reaction. You lose water. And so you could think maybe all of these sorts of chemistries can happen on surfaces when you dry things out. And in a sense, in a limited sense, they kind of do. Um, you might also think about things called condensing agents and what these are, we'll talk about these in more detail later, are things that remove the water in pieces so you can actually run this kind of chemistry in water. They kind of act a little bit like the enzymes do, but in a, uh, in a more subtle and often less effective way. And it's all dehydration. And that's actually- Yeah, this is water counter, oh. not, not counterintuitive, but it's, it's counter to like the model that I've got in my mind of like the, the primordial soup it's, uh, that sounds wet. <laughs> you could do a lot of the chemistry on the edges of the primordial soup, or you put something in the soup that kind of lets them take the water piece by piece. Um, okay. So water, and this is one of the big challenges is uh, this is why most synthetic organic chemists, uh, again, to emphasize, I'm not one of those, but I work with them. And they tend not to like to do reactions in water. They like to do them in um, uh, hexane or DSMO or various other things that don't have this kind of property. Uh, water breaks things down and it keeps things from being made. Water is a very difficult solvent for this kind of chemistry. And actually almost, I would say, by design, <laughs> because you don't want these things to react all the time. If you do that, yeah. you do and just end up with a mess. Hmm. That's the end of the introduction. That's it? Okay, wow. Okay. There's a lot more to origins, but that gives you enough so you can understand the debate. I need a I need a whole episode on just that. That was great. Good job. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks. that was that was really good. Yeah, it, it's a good introduction for uh for these clips, I suppose. So, why don't we go ahead and uh, and turn to those now? How does that sound? That sounds good. Okay. So, this first clip, so what we've done so so uh, well, actually, let me let me let you introduce the clips. You're the one that chose these two. So go ahead and just introduce the, the, the two clips that we have lined up today. All right. Uh, so in one of these, uh, Jim Tour writes some stuff on a board, um, and then Dave Farina um, uh, insults him, and then he yells at <laughs> Dave Farina. Um, more specifically, he's writing down some stuff about peptides. Um, and this is about that amino acid formation, the thing where you have to remove the water and try to pay attention. If you remember the amine, that NH2 thing and the carboxylic acid, that CO thing have to hook together and release water. Look at how many of those there are in each of these two molecules. And you might start to see why this might be a bigger problem than Dave seems to realize, at least initially. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's get this first clip. Uh, I've got it queued up here. Uh, if you'd like, we can pause it and comment as the video is going. Um, one other last note is that I've sped up the writing on the chalkboard for you guys. So that way you don't have to sit and uh, just watch them draw for minutes. So here we go. Let's go ahead and start the clip. If you, if we need to pause, just let me know. I will. One of the things that we have to make in order to have life are polypeptides. 
where we take amino acids, and these amino acids have to couple. And when they couple, it will form a dipeptide. This dipeptide is one of thousands and thousands and thousands that would have to form. If you were going to make a polypeptide, you'd need at least 100 of these for a very small polypeptide. <clears throat> Mr. Farina, show me the prebiotic chemistry that would do this coupling. Be my guest. Okay. So should we pause here and I feel like a, a comment from you might, might be helpful. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, um, uh, uh, I don't think quite yet, unfortunately. Ideally, this would be the perfect place to start talking. But unfortunately, <laughs> Dave Farina either because he just wasn't listening very carefully. He was just ready to jump in. Um, mm -hmm. or, or because he missed something about the chemistry. I don't know which. Um, brings up a paper that's useful to look at, but is actually irrelevant to the problem that Jim Tour just brought up. Um, but we should probably wait until he brings up that particular paper and then we can pause. Got it. Uh, yeah, I don't need the board. I... So this is my second prompt. So I guess we'll circle back to this. But um, yeah, you keep going, show me the references in your, uh, in your, in your content. But um, so you're missing a mountain of research, uh, literally a mountain of research that demonstrates this. So uh, here's one. Condensation of amino acids to form peptides in aqueous solution. So we've got sulfur-4, oxidative model. Uh, carbonyl sulfide mediated, pep, pre uh, mediated prebiotic formation of peptides. There's another one. That's the one. Uh, that All right. <laughs> and <laughs> Jim is about to jump in and say, that's not answering my question. And in that case, he would be correct. Um, but let's actually go into that, because that's actually a maybe nicer introduction into how some of this chemistry can actually work. This is going to get a little bit more complicated. Um, it's hard to avoid when looking into these things, but just remember the basic principle. You have to get rid of water, and either you do that by drying things out, or you can do that by removing the water piece by piece. Should we continue so playing, the, or did you want to comment further? Oh, no, no, a, I'll go through a couple slides. Um, okay. That's okay. Oh, you have slides oh. set up. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I could just talk through it, I suppose. Um, but yes, I do have just a couple slides set up for the discussion of peptides and a couple slides set up for the nucleotide discussion, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do that. It's yeah, just, let's do it. I, I just was I'm, I'm, I'm a very visual person. It just helps me to see these things. Yeah, no, no problem at all. I've got, I've already got it on the screen. Great. So peptides, peptide bonds in OCS. This is the paper that Dave mentioned, Lehman, Oracle, and Gadiri. Leslie Oracle was uh, one of the geniuses in origins, he's made so much progress in understanding how this sort of stuff can happen prebiotically. Um, a wonderful, wonderful papers. And he's a very careful chemist. So he's very honest about what can be done. He's honest about his yields. And um, yeah, just a really, really top scientist. And this is a fascinating paper. You start with this amino acid. I'm drawing it a little bit more like a chemist would draw it. Um, uh, so uh, with those particular lines, and uh, you see all the C's and H's all written out, eventually I'm going to drop those off too, because all the carbons will always have the maximum number of H's that they can have and everything. But this is exactly the same as the amino acid I wrote before, um, except in this case, uh, the O is missing a hydrogen, but that's often the way that it is uh, depending on, on, on the chemical setting. That amine can attach to OCS. OCS is uh, the carbonyl sulfide. Um, and this is uh, uh, a really amazing thing that can happen. It picks that up. And as you can see, this is already affecting the number of H's on that nitrogen. And this kind of group that's stuck onto that nitrogen can then help the rest of the chemistry. This thing cyclizes. It uh, makes that uh, pentagon shape. And then another amino acid can come in and knock uh, the rest of that OCS out and you get your dipeptide and you can do that in water. You have to do that at relatively high pH, which means there aren't a lot of protons moving around. The charged particles in the solution are not protons. They're heavier things that aren't so good at attaching or carrying charge from place to place. Um, but it still works. 
and uh, um, it gets respectable yields depending on what sort of surface it's run on um, or what other things are put in solution. Like if you put in uh, some soluble uh, lead, it turns out it works pretty well and you get 30%, 40% yields out of it. And yeah, it's actually quite astounding chemistry for what it is. Um, and that's what he's presenting there. Okay. I, I followed very little of that. Just letting okay. you know. Okay. Um, I guess the main thing to just take away is that the OCS attaches onto the side and allows you to take away that H2O from these two molecules uh -huh. okay. piece by piece. So it takes away an H in one place and then an H in another place. And then it takes away the O finally at the very end. And, and then so you get the linkage. Yes, and then you get the linkage without having to pull out water all at once. Because if you try that, you're doing that in water, and it'll just go okay. away. You know, it, it won't work. But if you pull it off piece by piece in this clever way, then it does work. Mm. And, the, and this is what was shown in the paper? And this is what is shown in the paper that Dave is talking about. Got it. Okay. And... Um, but here's the problem, which uh, 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 Jim Tour is going to get into pretty soon, is that here's the molecules, the way that they actually look. And as you can see, there are two, N, or actually three NH2s to attach to. There's one on the aspartic acid and there's two on the lysine. And so which one do you choose? Uh, and so what can happen, depending on which kind of activation chemistry you use, or even if you just dry it out, you can get these two, and those two are fine. Those two are the way that you would imagine this to work. Um, uh, you'll you'll just have something, one at the head and one at the tail. But then they can react with these side chains because the side chains have the same groups on them. So you could have your NH2 attack that, or this one attack that, or this one attack that. And if any of those happen, then now what happens is you have an amino acid hanging off of your side chain, and that's not going to work. At least no one's been able to come up with any sort of chemistry where that's effective. This is kind of a disaster, actually. All of a sudden, instead of having our magnetized Legos that were specific, we now have magnetized Legos that are like just magnetized Legos. And so when you have these kinds of amino acids, it's a real, real problem. Okay. And a problem that that OCS will not solve because the OCS will just attach onto any of those amines. Mm. Okay, so Dave was, was kind of acting like this one paper solves this big problem and tours like it does no. not solve it when you have these kinds of side chains and that's about what um jim's going to try to say okay okay all right let's go back to the clip yep all right here we go that does not do it and the two you showed do not do it this is called asparagine d k they do not do it with these. Okay, so what is the, Lehman's a fraud? Gadiri's a fraud? Are you ca calling them oh, a fraud? They published a paper, carbonyl sulfide mediated pre- First of all, I, I wanted to comment on like, just because you disagree with like the title of a paper doesn't mean that you're calling someone a fraud. That is like such a strange move to make. I don't, I mean, he makes a lot of strange moves in, in this debate, to be honest, but I, I just never- that one was that one was super strange. Like, uh, it's it's almost like a a sort of reaction. Like that that's the best he can do is is accuse someone of accusing someone else of of some doing you know be, being a um a liar or a fraud or something like that. When in fact that's like literally what he's accusing Jim of. So it's 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 very strange psychologically. There's a lot going on with Dave. I may actually do some uh, some other videos kind of looking at that a little bit more closely. I'm I'm actually pretty concerned. Yeah, you could. You could spend all night talking about that. Yeah, it's really concerning. But um, yeah, it's just never like he's not calling them a fraud. He's just disagreeing with with the the conclusions, the inferences that are being drawn from the actual data, the research. It's not. And that's actually not even so true. strange. <laughs> so um, Jim, I don't know what he thinks of that paper, to be honest, but he could completely agree with that paper and still raise this objection because the paper itself doesn't use these amino acids. It uses different amino acids because Orgel, a very good synthetic chemist, knows that it's not going to work with these. He's just trying to find the easiest cases where this can work. Oftentimes you start with glycine because that's the very easiest. Then you start with slightly more complicated side chains, certainly not charged side chains like these. Hmm. So you start with the easiest thing and you just work incrementally the way up. Um, so 
um, Jim certainly wouldn't have to say that uh, Orgel was a fraud. He <laughs> wouldn't even have to say that he disagrees with the conclusions. He could say this is perfectly good, beautiful chemistry that does not address what's on the board. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Biotic formation of peptides. So if you're saying they didn't do that, you're show me the example the in there. I studied this. I looked over every paper you, you put up. Have never studied anything in this area. Are you kidding me? All you do is go show me the papers, and then I show you papers. Here, let's see if I can find that one exactly. Yeah, sh show me the one exactly that does this in a prebiotic fashion. Show me. It's not there. Okay. I'm asking you to come up and show me the chemistry. James, you keep I don't need to write papers. on the board. I brought actual papers. This is actual research. Okay. Well, I mean, maybe another comment here is like, wh why do you think, uh, I don't want to get into psychoanalysis, uh, but um, what was behind, what, what do you think that his decision was? Like, wh why didn't he get up and, and write on the board? You think he just I cannot answer that for him. I will tell you why I would not have gotten up and written on the board. I actually would have done something on the board, but it would have been very cheeky and it wouldn't have been very chemically informative. I would have erased the side chains and changed them to something nicer to work with. Um, but uh, so even for synthetic chemists, even experienced synthetic chemists, writing these reactions is hard. And some of the most terrifying experiences I've had being part of uh, uh, when I was working as part of the Sutherland lab was just watching other people get up and try to write out these particular reactions in front of John Sutherland, who's a absolutely brilliant synthetic organic chemist. And it's so easy to make little mistakes. It's so easy to miss certain things mm -hmm. or to get the mechanisms wrong. Once you get up on that board, it becomes absolutely terrifying, even for people who do this for a living and are some of the best in their field. I can't imagine doing this in front of Jim Tour, also a great organic chemist, one of the best. Doing that as someone who's not that well versed in organic chemistry or even if you were doing that in front of a live audience like that would be terrifying i would try to stay as far from that board as i possibly could mm. which i guess sort of makes sense i, I mean the, the i guess the big question that i've got is do you think that he has the uh knowledge of chemistry to be able to do that like do you do you think that that was I maybe no a factor is like he just doesn't I don't really know, know him very well i really don't um uh, 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 I think that he has some chemistry education. He probably understands some of how this works. Um, in fact, uh, if, if he got a bachelor's or master's in chemistry, uh, he probably understands aspects of this better than I do. Uh, I'm perfectly mm -hmm. fine saying that. Um, but you need to actually carefully read the papers that you're talking about. That's one. And you need to really listen to what the other person is saying. Um, or else you're going to make replies that don't make a lot of sense. I think that that's part of what happened. But even there, and again, I can't speculate as to why he himself wouldn't write on the board, but I certainly wouldn't have wanted to write on the board like that just because well, well, um, it's an incredibly intimidating thing. Maybe Tour knew that, and that's part of what is, was part of his sort of rhetorical strategy. So it's not as if Dave was the only one with... Uh, using rhetoric, this was this was definitely something that that tour wanted to do. Maybe he knew. I'm, I'm sure he does. Uh, it's very difficult, like you, as you say, to write chemistry on the board. Maybe he was anticipating that and being like, he's not going to be able to do this. So this is going to make me look really good. Uh, Possibly. I don't know. I, again, I'm not going to try to psychoanalyze either of them. The way that you actually do this sort of thing in a group that's working on synthetic chemistry, and in our group, we would do this once every couple of weeks as we would pick up a synthesis paper and one of us would write through the mechanisms and talk about it and whether it worked or not. This is the way that you actually talk about how these things go. So this is this would be a respectable thing to do in a debate. I think it's a bit awkward, but for someone maybe mm -hmm. who has never done mm -hmm. debates, um, yeah. they wouldn't know that. But in a room where you're really trying to work out the science, it's totally legitimate to write these things out. This is how you understand. Yeah. And I mean, he did mention that he's like, he's a professor. He teaches in that room. So he's, he's probably used to, I mean, I, I can tell he's used to, to writing on that board. So, oh, yeah. I mean, he's very good at it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, before we get back into the clip, I'm sure that we've lost a lot of the audience on like where we are in this clip. So give us a quick, uh, summary of like where we are and what's about to happen. Exactly on the slide that I stopped with, which had all of those arrows and question marks, which is that Jim tour is trying to say, look, this doesn't, work because of the side chains 
and Dave just bringing up an irrelevant example. They're talking right. past each other right now. Let's continue. Show me the paper. Show me in that paper this example. Okay. This is called. At, this, this is, is called the one you wanted. Aspartic James. acid. James. This is called lysine. James, look. This is the Gadiri paper. Here's the scheme. You want to you want to go through that? that? But aqueous aqueous room temperature. You get oligopeptides. Okay, and it jumps to 80% yield with prebiotic oxidizing agents. But like not, not with this, cyanide. because what happens is this would participate. This oh, would participate. Oh, you want to do the side chain thing. Okay, well, we've got research for that, too. The, the, of course, I'm speaking to the side chain. This is not glycine. Uh, That's not prebiotically relevant. So you're, you're laughing. So he's been talking about side chains the whole time, and Dave is just now realizing this. Correct. And I was actually just laughing at the comment of this. It's not glycine. Because oh. glycine is the simplest one. The side chain is just a hydrogen atom. So, yeah. Got it. What that has nothing to do with prebiotic. Okay, that how about this one? That sulfur compound was made separately in dichloromethane using HOBT, which is a coupling agent designed by human beings for solid phase synthesis. Ginger, That's how they made the Are you the saying bio. sulfur is not available prebiotically? It doesn't matter what solvent they use. No, HOBT was the, the compound, that SH compound that you just showed was made in a separate reaction. That was in, in a separate reaction and he describes that. Okay. I can show you in the paper. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you don't like that one, how about this powder one? Uh, Pounder, Jack's reduced peptide formation, acylated amino nitrile. Uh, right. Wait, hold on. I got the scheme here. It's not in there. You're going to look and look. It's not in there. I studied every one of your papers. Hmm. Pounder doesn't even use uh, uh, amino acids. He uses an amino... Amino nitrile. Amino, that's a, amino nitrile. That's a totally that is different not paper. An amino acid. James, that's not the same paper. You're no, talking about a different there paper. There is no coupling. Look, he got coupling with lysine, regioselective lysine ligation, the most selective peptide ligation that tolerates all proteinogenic side chains. But he did he this does not with do all side an chains. amino acid coupling. He's got what are you Z talking about? Prebiotic catalytic peptide ligation. There's no amino acids there. He's yes, start... it's amino acids. Okay, so what go, are you go talking to the about? equation of well, that. Go to the equation of What'd you say? This is probably a good place to stop. Okay. So um, there is a paper um, about the just using amino nitriles. And then there's the paper that Dave is talking about. Um, and uh, that particular paper uses a mixture of amino nitriles and amino acids, actually. So it's not just amino acids and it's not just amino nitriles. But these are just words. Um, I can show the slides a little bit about how this particular scheme works and how it helps. Yeah, sure. All right. So this is amino nitrile ligation, peptide formation. This is exactly the paper that Dave was just talking about. Here is your amino nitrile. Um, there's your amine. It has an extra little group on at the end. We can talk about that if it came up in... Q&A or something, we could talk about it. But the real important thing here is that you have your amine group here and your nitrile here. The nitrile just means CN. So you have your NH there, and then you have your CN there. Instead of having that COOH thing, you now have a CN. Now, the reason why people would use this is because actually these are the precursors in a lot of prebiotic synthesis to the amino acids. The amino nitriles are easier to form. So it'd be very likely if you're doing this in a prebiotic setting that you would have a mixture of amino nitriles and amino acids. He also adds in this uh, sulfur compound. There was a complaint about how that was formed, but the real important thing here is that uh, um, uh, uh, Singadol wanted to form a whole bunch of different ones of these um, just to see how they would work with this chemistry. They weren't looking so much specifically for prebiotic plausibility, although a lot of them can be explained um, from geochemical settings. Not all of them can. It's really just trying to understand how this chemistry might work with a molecule that looks like this. And then later on, other scientists might be able to identify what that molecule should in fact be. And so this is what they do here, is it starts with where you see the one, and um, it attaches the two, and it does it using that HSR in exactly the same way, or very much the same way, as the um, as the OCS, except in this case, you have the amino nitrile. And the amino nitrile gives you a very specific way in which this is going to attach. It's really going to want to attach onto that CN thing. 
So it will attach onto that CN thing and it leaves this NH with that double bond on the N. And it just turns out that for, um, uh, uh, for, for deep and fascinating chemical reasons, that NH gets replaced. Uh, um, uh, it takes in water and it kicks out ammonia. And that gives you a dipeptide. And it turns out that you can extend this to tripeptides and even make longer chains. And this will only look at the places where you want to link these up. These will not attack the side chains. And so as it turns out, this will work with lysine. You might notice that I did, in fact, uh, replace the other one. It's no longer um, aspartic acid. It's now um, uh, virtually alanine. It's whatever the nitrile equivalent of alanine is. This will happen. But that other um, uh, NH2 uh, can't participate in that kind of reaction. And so you get exactly what it is that you would expect. And uh, it's regioselective, meaning that it builds the thing in the right shape effectively. So, so now you don't but, have all of these different options of connection. You have correct. one. Correct. You've now simplified things beautifully. Um, uh, but is the problem is the problem that this is this is very specific to these specific are these molecules? So this will actually work with almost any molecules. The one okay. question that you would have that remains is does it actually work when they're both charged? It is specific there, but maybe these two side chains could react with each other and that would be a disaster. Um, I think that there are some chemical reasons after talking with some of my organic chemistry friends that this would not happen in this case. And the main reason this would not happen is that actually wouldn't be NH2, but NH3 plus because this is run at pH of seven. So it's run at neutral pH, basically regular water, like what you drink. A lot of times they make this very, very alkaline to get the chemistry to work. In this case, this actually runs best at neutral pH, which is fascinating. That's the same pH as cells are. So that's kind of encouraging. And there would be reasons to think that the nitrogen would not attack that carbon under these circumstances. So this is totally plausible that actually the exact thing that Jim Tour wrote out could work with this kind of chemistry. Um, but as far as I can tell, no one's ever tested it. And it would be really important to actually test before making strong claims. Just like I said near the beginning, uh, the experiment is is the crucible by which all these things actually have to be judged. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't even matter what a skilled organic chemist says. What really matters is what the experiment shows. So, I mean, there was a lot there that I didn't follow, but from what I did oh. follow, it sounded like this is a plausible answer to the puzzle or like to the, at least tours, the, the, the puzzle that he set up in the first clip. I think that it might be. I think more experiments would be necessary to really, really validate it for those specific two amino acids because the side chains might interact with each other. Um, it answers half of it. Like if you just have one amino acid that has a side chain that might react with one of the terminus. So if the side chain ends up hooking up with the end, it stops that from happening. So that's good. Mm -hmm. But if both of them have side chains that can react with each other, maybe those side chains would react still. And that's something that at least as far as I can tell has never been tested. Okay. And I, I so, suppose like, um, maybe I'm just completely ignorant about this. It, the side chains. So like if those started interacting, right, you, you need to have like, um, really long chains of these molecules lined up back to back. You need a whole bunch of reactions. It's not enough to have like success in one case, right? You need to have no. success you need across to have multiple, success like in almost all of the cases, even if you have a few that are out of place, the thing won't fold right. Even if they're all in place, in fact, uh, uh, um, there's there's this paradox called called Leventhal's paradox. Even if you have them all right, it's not a guarantee that that particular sequence will fold the way that you want it to. Um, the sequence might have to be quite specific under certain circumstances. Mm. Um, but certainly, if you have things that aren't even attached in the right way, it's very difficult to imagine. And it's, as far as I know, never been experimentally shown that these would be really effective at doing anything. You just end up with a mess. It's kind of like, again, having the magnets, but imagine that you just added an extra pole to your magnet. And so now there's an extra way things can stick together. And so now all your magnets are sticking together in the wrong ways. And you wanted to make one particular shape, but now you can't control the shape anymore. So it's almost like the, the analogy I'm thinking of is it'd be like flipping a coin. Suppose that 
there was like a 50% chance of getting it wrong. Like if the side chains interact with each other, there's like a 50% yep. chance of, of getting it wrong in each reaction. Then, yep. um, but if you need like hundreds of these back to back, then you'd have to like basically like flip a coin and get heads, you know, 300 times in a row, something like that. Yes. And, that, you and then even then, work. like you said, yeah, e even then, like you said, it could, it could be that there's some uh, puzzle. What, what was it that you said that like, even if you got Let everything in the right sequence of it? So yeah, um, it may it may still not work. Yeah, there are a lot of problems. Even if you build these macromolecules, there are still a lot of problems for for using these for 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 any sort of uh, for any sort of further chemistry or anything that looks like biochemistry. That's a whole other stage of this problem. But first, you need to. Link so what you're together. saying is that this is at least like an initial response that can be made that like at least sheds light kind of like the analogy that you gave of like we, we found another pebble on the beach or something like that or like another exactly sand. like we've this got is something yeah and i'll go back to my three things right initial conditions the reactions and the outcome the initial conditions are a bit uncertain we don't really know what that sulfur species is that's going to attach to that nitrile and do all this magic work we found some that do it but we're not sure how prebiotically plausible they are, how many of them would be around. The actual reactions themselves, we know that they work beautifully in a lab and they get very high yields. Would this actually happen without someone controlling the chemistry? And that deals with chemical timing. That's something that I'm researching and, and, and in fact will be researching for these specific kinds of reactions, whether mm. the speed at which they they happen is compatible with this chemistry working. And if it's not, then we need to find some different chemistry because then great, we found something that works in the lab. That's a good clue. I think we're not clueless, right? Um, that's, that's still a good clue, but it's not something that will be directly applicable to that kind of environment. And then the outcome is very uncertain. Once you build these things, what do you do with them? I think that there's good indication that that gets you closer to something. And a lot of these have interesting catalytic properties and they're interesting ways that they bond with pieces of RNA, all kinds of fascinating stuff. But it starts getting really, really hazy there. Even if you build these things in the right way, what do you actually do with them? Yeah, I, I wonder, you, you use the word clueless, and I wonder if that is maybe a sticking point here. Because I think he defined it in his opening statement, but it was a really strange way to define it. But um, you would have to define it in a strange way to say that we're really clueless about origins research, actually. Yeah, in yeah. So it, it, like say, we got lots of clues. Um, it's just exactly that, right. You can have lots yeah. of clues, but it doesn't mean that you're like confident that you, you found out how it, exactly that it happened or, or, or oh, even sure. if you've got like a. Um, yeah, you could just say that you've got like clues, like you said, like you don't know exactly what it looks like or what it even could look like, but there are some there's some ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe maybe that's just the wrong terminology to use for Dr. Yeah. Tour. Because I think he yeah. probably means that we're, uh, we're very far away maybe from really understanding it. And that you may yeah. agree with, but he would I just, definitely have, yeah, agree just say terminology. Very, yeah, I definitely agree that we're very, very far away. I think interestingly, though, we're accelerating in our exploration and progress of this. More and more interesting stuff and more stuff of real substance keeps coming out year by year. And you can tell because it's getting funded more, there are these centers that are coming up, more mm. uh, prominent chemists are starting to get involved with this. It's a real burgeoning field, but it's the sort of question of you have something that's accelerating, but then you have so far to go, how long will it take? There's no guarantee that acceleration even will last forever. So it's very difficult to determine you know, is this really going to happen in 20 years? I think that's way too optimistic. Is this going to happen in 100 years? Maybe this is going to take, is going to be more like the difference between Newton and Einstein, where you had to wait, you know, hundreds of years. Maybe it's more like that. It's very hard to tell when you're in a situation where some really key breakthroughs have happened. A lot of acceleration is going on, but you still start to see how incredibly far you have to go. Yeah, you know, it's so very hard to estimate those things. So let's get back to the clip. Um, basically, sure. what, what's happened, if I can summarize, if I can attempt to summarize it, is that Dave's paper does give us a clue, but it doesn't completely solve the problem. And then they're probably going to yeah. end up just talking past each other as a result of that. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, well, let's let's continue. We'll get through this one. Let's see how much time we have left on this clip, about another two minutes. Then we'll play uh, another clip, and then we should end the stream after that one. But we still got a, okay. a little bit 
ways to go here. So let's continue. I don't have that one, but you're just lying. You're also no, shifting the goalposts, though. Because by the way, you you pretend that there are no papers that there are no papers that show any peptide formation in water. I just showed you a ton. You're shifting but goalposts by complaining about the side chains. How am I shifting chains. the goalposts? These are the Be ones you've got to do. If you can't you can't do it with these active side chains. You cannot. But he did. Counter didn't do it with the active side chains. He used an amino nitrile. Okay, there are no amino acids. No, 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 acids. James, you're talking about a completely different paper. Peptide ligation by chemoselective of amino nitrile coupling in water. That that's is an a amino different, nitrile. It's that amino is a nitrile. different paper. It's not amino acid coupling. Uh, I know, that's a different paper. He takes amino acid. This is just a different, this is a different, he's not going through peptide bond formation. It's a different, right? So he, you have peptides, you have, you have amino acids condensing, that's peptide formation. He's figuring out a different synthetic pathway that doesn't do coupling, but it doesn't matter. There's a million of these, right? Condensation by wet dry cycling. Not, nobody has done coupling. this. I'm asking you for okay. a specific reaction because half of the amino yeah. acids, half of the amino acids have active side chains. And these guys play this game of not including these ones that have carboxylic acids, not including the ones James, that have amines. This is an acylated, you can't do this coupling. Acylated amino nitrile plus unprotected amino acid uh, hydrolyzes the pH 7 right. to form a dipeptide. Which amino acid? Hydroxylated ones, never carboxylated, never the aminated. All proteinogenic side chains, all from amino nitriles. James, I'm telling you, he did this with lysine. Okay, so the side chain thing is not a problem. So forget the fact that you can't handle that. Right, that peptide formation in water happens and has been demonstrated by about a dozen of these papers that I've shown you. Only now with an activator, as you said in your second series. Yeah, chemical your activator. Series, Prebiotically your first, plausible chemical activator. Your first activator. series, you never said this. As, with an activator, you're not coupling so free amino acids. Okay, yes, we've reached you're the, not end. Coupling. We've reached the sulfide. end of the five minutes. All right, so that's the end of that one. What, what, uh, what are your thoughts on the remainder of that clip? Um... I think that there were some interesting things that were stated about activation. The main thing that I just wanted to say at the very end was that um, Dave seems to have a little bit of a misunderstanding about whether amino acids were used or amino nitriles were used. And one of the important results of the paper, um, uh, um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the Pounder paper, uh, is in fact that you can use amino nitriles to get peptide bonding. You don't need to use amino acids. And that seemed to have been missed by 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 Dave and I don't think Jim really wanted to comment on that because he might have some issues with how plausible amino nitrile um, uh, reactions happen to be. I'm not exactly sure what why he didn't bring this up, but uh, um, it it's also very chaotic. It's it might be very difficult to make those kinds of points at that point. All right, shall we move on to uh, yeah. cut number two? Okay, let's do it. Let's just continue. Yeah, so we're, uh, we're, we're skipping. That was, I think, uh, Dr. Tour's first prompt. And now we're moving on to his second prompt, which he, he's lift, he's listed out. You can kind of see it on the on the, the screen here. Uh, he's listed out five different things that you need in order to to have life. And so he uh, he did the first one. That was his first prompt. And then the second one. What is the second one? I can't I can't read it on the screen. Uh, it should be ribonucleotides, I think. Okay, completely wrong. Okay. All right, let's move it to clip two. Here we go. Pull it up on the screen. All right, there we go. And I'll hit play. And uh, I actually sped up the the writing on the chalkboard. This is four times, four times the 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 normal speed that it is. So in case you guys were wondering, this is uh uh why I couldn't I couldn't remember your name. Paul was um was commenting like he wishes he could write this fast four times <laughs> as fast as like what's normal. But uh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll play this clip. And then uh, again, just like the first one, let me know if you'd like to pause and comment. Polynucleotides, you have to be able to make RNA. You have to be able to take this molecule and hook it together many, many times to have a dimer of RNA, abbreviating the base this time as B, abbreviating the triphosphate as P3. What you have to be able to do is show me chemistry. I'm asking you specifically for chemistry, yeah. not a bunch of nonsense here. Show me the chemistry not a bunch to get of this, this reaction to go such that you get coupling between the three prime hydroxyl to this five prime site. So you need three prime, five prime coupling. 
to the exclusion of two prime, five prime coupling, to the exclusion of branching. Every article that you cited in your videos, every article that you could ever cite that shows this coupling, shows this scrambling, you get significant amounts of 2,5, significant amount of branching. And that's why this chemistry doesn't work, and that's why your own expert, Jack Sostek, even says that Benner's work, Benner's work, where he, he talked about this thing, was, was just hyped up. There was nothing there, because he says he went with the hype, he did not go with, 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 with okay, the, the right couple. Show me so the chemistry. Two minutes Show me this okay. chemistry. So first of all, this is completely idiotic. Uh, our, uh, nucle nucleotide polymerization has been demonstrated on Montmorelite Mont 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 clay for decades. Yes, yes. And, with, with 30 to 70 percent to five. I asked you for three five, which is what you need to have you life. Can you do me a favor here? I, I want you to read the, the title of that paper there. It's by your buddy, Jack Shostak. He's done some research on this. Yeah, I know. And Jack Sostek even says he cannot get it. Functional uh, art, except for tolerance for non-inheritable 2,5. How much tolerance? How much? Montmorillonite clay is 30 to 70%. James, what's the first word in that paper? Functional. So we're talking about RNAs that still have catalytic behavior, despite having a mixture of 2,5 and 3 prime. His, three his five amount linkages. of 2,5 to 3,5 is not 30 to 70%. If James, you have... If you have a 0.1%, you're okay, because you'll no. have runs, but not 30 to 70%. Show me the amount. Your guy Deemer never tells us how much is there. James, this, look, the and research And Benner never told us how much is there. Functional RNAs. So it doesn't matter how much 2 prime, doesn't matter oh, how much it, Oh, it certainly He's does. Allowing them and, to and what about branching? My God. It's not there. It's not Let's there. See. Nobody has ever done this prebiotically. You're going to be looking through your papers a long time. It's never been done. Without an James, enzyme, it is never you been done. You are completely done. clueless. It's this over. Has been done. It's over. You can't make RNA. There's no life. You can't make RNA. All right. This is probably a good place to stop. Um, I have a couple slides here. All right. Ready to go. So here's the problem. Here's the same thing that... Uh, that Jim showed. You have your two bases, and then you have your two sugars, and then you have your two phosphates, and you need to get rid of that um, H2O again. You need to hook this up, and you can see there are two places to do it. Do you do it here or here? Um, you want to do it on a particular place. What's a prime and who cares? Um, this is one prime. This is how you number the carbon so you know which carbon you're talking about when you're just chatting about this. You know, you just want to talk about uh, uh, the sugars that are attached to bases. If you want to talk about the carbons in the bases, you don't put the prime there. But you want to talk about the sugar, you put the prime there. One prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. Three prime is there. Oops. So you want the, um, the OH that's closest to the three prime to connect with the uh, phosphate that's closest to the five prime on the other one. And you don't want it to connect to that two prime one. But it's just as likely in, on, on almost all circumstances, you know, it's 50-50 again. It's, it's like the coin flip. Under certain circumstances, actually, it prefers the two prime, five prime. Um, and in certain circumstances, it prefers the three prime, five prime, but not by a whole lot. And so, um, so Dave says, quick, well, the five prime Five prime. You're talking about the the, the two five five prime. It, the five prime would be on the bottom. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, I wish I could move my mouse to emphasize this, but the f um, imagine that all those primes were at the sugar below as well. I should have added those on the sugar below. Um, yeah. So it's connecting the to the is, yes to the OH, the but it's closest to the five prime. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And so what? So yeah. And, it, so it's the same kind of situation where they can connect on, on either one. And so yep. Tour's point is that you don't have like a mechanism that's going to, to get you what, what you need. You need it to connect yep. from the five prime to the three prime most of the time, yes. right? Like I think, I think he said like 70% of the time or something like that. He said that actually there are some experiments um, uh, which will give you uh, it 70% of the time. So like a okay. prebiotically relevant experiments that will get you 70%. But what he's saying is you need to get like about 100%. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you, do you agree? Is, is that true? Um, it depends on what you want to do. And that's what we'll get into because Dave Farina does bring up a relevant paper here. 
okay. uh, Inglehart, um, Pounder, and uh, and Shostak. Um, and this is where I say, at least in my opinion, we're not clueless. Um, and I do think that Dave is correct, at least on this point. Again, we do have some clues. And um, what they did is they looked at this thing. All these different letters are showing the, the different bases. And if somehow this... Who cares about how this arose? Let's just say that somehow it just popped into existence or something like it did. Um, each of these is a different nucleotide all hooked together. Um, and certainly, you know, um, Jack Shostak can make this in his lab or, uh, or Inglehart or Matt Pounder can make this in a lab. Um, or there are different ways to try to evolve these particular sequences. The amazing thing that this does is it can attach onto other um, RNA strands and rip them in into two pieces. It cleaves them. It's called the hammerhead ribozyme. And what they did was they took different ones of these nucleotides and replaced the three prime, five prime linkages with two prime, five prime linkages, the wrong linkage. And they figured out if we replace a certain fraction of these, does it still cut the RNA apart? Is it still doing what it was intended to do? And so what they find out is if, um, if they're all three prime, five prime, it works pretty well. It does it 80% of the time, which is pretty good for a ribozyme. If you replace 10% of them, so 10% of them have the wrong link, then um, at that point, you know, maybe 60%, 70%, still pretty good. When you do it with 25%, it really starts breaking down at that point. Then you're talking about around 20% success rate, which is not great, but maybe it's something you could work with. I don't know. Um, uh, once you have 50%, though, you see that we're sunk. Um, uh, it doesn't do the job at all anymore. And so you still do get this um, effective um, uh, uh, breaking thing. The ribozyme is doing what it, was, uh, uh, um, what it was intended to do, even when you have a whole bunch of random 2 prime, 5 prime connections there. So in that sense, actually, this is a really interesting result. It shows that you don't need to be perfect. And in fact, you don't even need to be all that close to perfect to still maintain some function. I'm now going to quote um, uh, John Sutherland from that end of the beginning paper to say that even though we're not clueless, oh, actually, first, there's one other thing that I wanted to bring up. I won't go into much detail here, except just to say there is a wonderful prebiotic way to actually cycle through the 2 prime, 5 prime so that the water will preferentially attack those and break those apart, whereas um, the water can't attack the three prime, five prime ones as effectively in certain prebiotic conditions. And so what happens is you eventually eat away all your two prime, five prime connections and replace them with three prime, five prime connections. So there's actually a nice prebiotic and that way happens naturally? to proof, proofread your RNA. Hmm. So that's really cool. I say that that's another interesting clue. But I will finish with this quote. It, it does get a little technical, um, but there's a really important point at the end, which is in the case of RNA, not only must the phosphodiester links be repeatedly forged, but they must ultimately connect the five prime oxygen of one nucleotide to the three prime oxygen, not the two prime oxygen of the next nucleotide. Two prime, five prime linkages can be tolerated functionally at low levels in certain RNAs. He's referring to that Shostak paper but they are not inheritable in a sequence specific manner, which means if you're using ribozymes to copy and you know, replicate other ribozymes, those replicated ribozymes will not have the same uh, two, five, two prime, five primes in the same places. And so their function will be different. And so there's no way to inherit function this way. So even if it turns out it, something has this function, there's no guarantee that the next generation will have that same function at all. So nothing's inheritable. There's no way to evolve these sorts of things. And then uh, Sutherland also mentions that for most intents and purposes, extant biology uses three prime, five prime linkages anyway. Although we have demonstrated, and this is referring to that previous slide, that three prime, five prime linkages can be preferentially formed by prebiotically, by prebiotically selective o, uh, two prime O acetylation and ligation um, of those mixtures of oligonucleotides with two prime and three prime phosphate termini, the synthetic selectivities and preferences are not enough to explain how RNA with all the three prime, five prime linkages might have first been produced. So even the cycling mechanism, when they tried it, they only put in one error 
only one that was wrong and show that you could replace it with the one that was right. Um, it, and it works, but it doesn't work all the time. And it's, there's still a lot that's missing there in terms of how you would actually solve this problem. So in, in that sense, um, uh, uh, Tour is absolutely right that this is a very important and unsolved problem in terms of, uh, of how you would actually build RNA. Hmm. And actually, was, I'm not gonna... sure if there's much else to say um, in terms of uh, the rest of the clip. Um, come to think of it, because I I think that that really just gets to the heart of it. Okay. Uh, the yeah, we rest of the to... clip is really them just bickering about um, uh, Jim Tour is upset that uh, Dave Freina doesn't remember the percentages, and Dave is basically saying that the percentages don't matter. And there's also a discussion about what function actually is. And that gets back mm. to what John Sutherland is talking about with how do you inherit this stuff? What do you actually do with it? It seems pretty useless, even though that function is maintained. And so maybe it suggests that you don't need to have perfect right away. You'll, you're going to need that proofreading really early on before you're going to build anything that, um, that you would be able to then copy and then select for function. Okay. So I'm, I'm having trouble understanding this one. Sounds So it sounds like initially you could have mostly three, five linkages, some two, five link linkages, and that be okay. But yeah. eventually you're going to need all three, five linkages. And so the, yes. the question is, how do we get, we're not there. We don't know how to get all three, five linkages, but at least at the time being, we can get mostly three, five linkages, which does get you some functionality. But yes. eventually, we need. You, eventually, you're gonna have to have three five linkages. So it's Absolutely. like. So it's like they're. So it's kind of like they're both correct. So like Dave is saying, no, we have some idea, and then Tour is like, no, we need all of it. You're not there. You don't have all of it, so you have nothing basically. And yeah. Dave's like, no, we have something, and so that's kind of like the, the, um, them talking past each other. They are talking past each other. I think both of them are right on certain aspects. I would say Tour is more correct on this one in terms of uh, if you really want to get to something that's capable of Darwinian evolution eventually, you can't have any of these sticking around. And because these can't be inherited, it's hard to see how you would, even if you could have some sort of Darwinian selection, how would you select for the three prime, five prime ones? Because those, that that information in those sugars isn't in the bases. So there's no way that the bases know that about the sugars. So there's no mm -hmm. way to, you know, for, for that base to say, well, I'm only going to copy with the base where the sugar is doing the same thing. Yeah. So there's no way for there to be any real improvement unless you fix that problem really early on. Um, so I would say that this is a very serious problem that there are a couple very small hints. Um, I think that, um, uh, uh, Jack Shostak's paper definitely points out that there's a bit more flexibility than people initially thought. And I think that um, uh, uh, Angelica Mariani's work with this sort of proofreading is just wonderful and shows that there might be ways to lead to this correction before you have Darwinian evolution, like chemically selective ways to, to just show that this structure is in fact preferable just on a basic chemical scale. But we haven't found the chemistry that allows you to fix the problem yet. Nobody knows the chemistry mm. that actually fixes the problem. And so Jim Tour is actually, you know, I don't want to say clueless again, but maybe in his sort of way that he defines it, we have a, you know, we don't really know how to fix this particular problem. And, and again, that's my sort of reading of it, um, uh, both as someone who works in the field, but is not an organic chemist, but who talks with organic chemists who do work on this. And you can find a lot of papers where people say the same thing, that this is an important problem and an unsolved problem. You can go ahead and stop sharing your screen if you want. That way you can Great. see what's going on on the, on the screen again. Cause I know Yay. that as, as you're sharing, you can't, you nice can't to see, see you. So <laughs> yeah, you've been, you've been talking to yourself the whole time pretty much. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, th there's not, we're not going to comment on, on any of the rest of the debate. This was what you thought was like the most scientifically relevant sections. And we've, as you can see, we've had to cut a lot out so that we could actually talk about the science. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was thinking like this, if they were able to just talk about this, this would have been a great conversation, you know, oh, yeah. especially I like love this conversation. This is uh this is what I would have hoped for. Um, and yeah. 
I completely leave it up to you as to whether there are questions, because maybe other people who are watching this would think of other things that they would want to ask. If there's no time for that, um, uh, uh, um, please, if you're really interested, uh, you'd be welcome to drop me a line or something, and uh, uh, we can definitely talk about this. I love talking about prebiotic chemistry stuff. Yeah, well, uh, we can open it up for questions. We haven't had any questions yet, and um, okay. I, I haven't even let the audience know that that they can send in questions. So we can do that. Uh, I've got I've got maybe another 10, 15 minutes, but then I've, I do got to go. Okay. My daughter actually, as the questions start to come in, I can just kind of dote on my daughter a little bit. She uh, She's in second grade, and she huh? had their... Uh, tomorrow's like the last day of school, and so she was they were like giving out awards today at school, just like the kind of thing that they do at the, the end of every school year. And apparently I wasn't able to watch. I was, I was working on stuff, but she was, <clears throat> she got like all of these awards, like past all, like every subject flying colors, got all like a handwriting award, all these different awards. Very, very proud of her. So we're oh, actually wow. going to go take her out and, and get some, uh, uh, there, there's this place called fizz near where we live. And it's like a, they basically just make kind of like special drinks, kind of like Sonic. I'm sure okay. you're familiar with Sonic as an American. Oh yeah, definitely. Living in the UK, uh, but yeah, they have like you I can have like Sonic chocolate much in the or, UK, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they have all these different flavors that you can add in the drinks and stuff. So we're, oh, I think we're gonna go go take her there and and uh, sounds like a wonderful way to food. celebrate uh, uh, celebrate achievement. Yeah, yeah, we were we were pretty surprised. I was like, I mean, we we work with her and we. we I'm like the math guy. My wife, she's she's like the English person. So, so we, yeah, we we work with her a lot, but we didn't know that she was that good. You know, we didn't know she was that amazing. So it was, it was just pretty cool. It was pretty. It's cool always nice to hear it from other people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let Let's see. Let me let me scroll through some of the questions here and see if I can okay. pull some up. Okay. Yeah. It looks like we have one from Brando. I'll put this on the screen as we're, uh, I'll be looking at the others as we start to get these on the screen here. Okay. Question. Can you speak to the probabilities of these things actually occurring in the allotted time and how many seemingly miraculous events would need to occur for it to happen? So I think that's a wonderful question. Um, I can't with any real authority right now. This is actually a big part of what I am kind of researching right now, which is uh, coming up with kinetics, which is finding out how fast this chemistry happens. Once you know how fast each of the reactions happen, both to give you the products you want and the products you don't, you can try to put that together to figure out under what environments you could have this productive chemistry without someone sitting there guiding it along the way. Um, there are ways to get around certain problems, like if some chemistry isn't happening fast enough, or if you don't get the yields that you want, you want high yields or else you run into this problem where you're multiplying small numbers by small numbers, and you're eventually doing homeopathy rather than prebiotic chemistry. So you need good yields. If you don't have such good yields, you can try to crystallize things out. There are various ways to try to purify things, but each of those, when it's done by a chemist, if it's going to be done in a natural environment, becomes much, much less likely to actually work out. Um, and so you can actually do this. I, uh, in that chapter that I shared, I have a series of streams and just say, how many streams can you have in a sequence before you only have one example of life in the universe? And it turns out you don't need that many streams, even with generous assumptions of um, uh, uh, um, how, how many total streams you have, how many exoplanets there are, you know, the size of the observable universe is very large, but it turns out that combinatorics, the number of streams you actually need crossing in a certain sequence, you don't have to add too many of those, about 12 or 13 steps like that before then you start talking about being alone in the universe. So either there's a whole different way of doing the chemistry than that, or if you really need to do that sort of sequence stuff, it might turn out life is very rare, or there's a very clever way to do a lot of this stuff in one pot so you don't need that, that many streams. All right. So I've got enough questions lined up here that we're not going to need you guys to send in any more for at least the rest of the stream. So uh, thank you guys for, for sending them in. Unfortunately, we can't get to every question that's sent in. Here's the next one from Kevin. He says, I am just a chemical engineer. Is that what he's C H E English? I don't know. Um, I didn't follow perfectly, but is it fair to say that Dr. Tour overstates his case somewhat, even if there's large grains of truth in there? 
So I think that he overstates his case a lot, um, actually. I think he's way too negative about this. But the nice thing about when you have a question where you don't know the answer, um, you should really welcome a diversity of opinions. And so uh, even though I think he's completely wrong, um, that we're clueless and, um, and that he, he, I do think that he's way too negative about a lot of this chemistry, I think even though you do it one way in the lab, you can show that it would work a different way in a real environment. The way the reasons you don't do that in a real environment is because a lot of this chemistry is poisonous. It'll kill you. So you want to use very small samples. So you have to use higher concentrations to see anything. Um, and you might generate it in a way that's a lot safer. You don't necessarily want to build a volcano in your lab. Um, there are there are lots of, of reasons why some of the chemistry that Jim Tour picks on it's true, it wouldn't happen that way on the early Earth, but you can still get the same chemistry happening a different way. Um, I do entirely agree with him, though, that we're a long way away. And I also agree with him, and this is something important that often gets lost in these discussions, that he does think that uh, someday we may really solve this. And uh, I'm a little bit more positive about that. I think we're making inroads and someday we really mm -hmm. will have the solution. But I can't really defend that as far away as we are entirely. That's just... a uh, um, uh, evidence-informed hope that I have for the future of this field. All right, next question from Reed Gore. To clarify, when Dave said the 2-5 prime does not matter, he is entirely incorrect? Also, the, well, let's start with that one and then we'll get to the next one. <laughs> if you want to take that completely literally, that is entirely incorrect. So if he wants to say it doesn't matter at all, then that's clearly wrong. It matters for all sorts of reasons. And in fact, um, there are good reasons to want pretty much pure three prime, five prime. There are very good reasons to actually want that to work out. Um, so you wouldn't even say that having a small amount of error doesn't matter. It all matters. You really need that three prime, five prime at some point. So if, if he's not just speaking kind of rhetorically and just saying, well, about mm. this one paper and this one set of functions, it doesn't matter as much. Maybe that's what he meant. But if he really meant that literally, he's 100% wrong. Yeah. And then, and then um, again, I'm, I'm kind of approaching this as a complete novice, but like the functional aspect, I don't think that that can be translated as like, you know, three, three, five, five prime, right? You have to say like functional can mean like that. I think the moderator even pointed this out. Like functional can take on a whole lot of different meanings just because it says functional. And I think even Dave, like if we would have watched more of that clip, he, I think he accuses Tour of calling him a fraud as well, or them. I think it's like a bunch of people that worked on that paper, but it, it, that if you have some errors, like if you have some two, five, what is it? Two prime, five prime linkages, you mm -hmm. can have some error, but then still be functional. But then the point is oh, that yeah. you need three, five, five prime, three prime, five prime to, uh, to, to have, you said, evolution later on. So, yeah. and I hope my point was clear. But <laughs> And joining them together are useful functions. But there are two important things there is that those aren't the only functions that you need to have a living system by far. And it's not clear the other functions would work as well with the two prime, five prime linkages. But the other, and I think even more important thing is those are not inheritable. So you'll have this wonderful machine. It will do some interesting chemistry. The system will start to look really cool. All this neat stuff will start to just happen all of a sudden. Then eventually that machine will break. Your RNA breaks and then it's over because you weren't able to inherit that specific thing that it was able to do anymore. Mm. Um, if you know you have smaller numbers, maybe you can keep building these bad machines. They'll somehow copy each other, but the copying fidelity is so low. And this is something actually Sigart has worked on and he's published a couple papers on. Um, uh, uh, but it goes back to Manfred Eigen. If you don't have reliable copying, much more reliable than that with all the information, uh, you can't have Darwinian evolution at all. And if you don't have that, then there's nothing to inherit. You can't keep any of these traits around. So you can't bring function forward. You can't improve it in any way. And there's no way to inherit any of this two prime, five prime stuff. It's just not part of the information that gets copied. What if oh, I'm just maybe I'm completely wrong about this? Could could replication help the the go from a a system that is mostly three prime five prime to all three prime five prime through replication th through, through a process that happens later on? Is that possible? 
but I, I know that replication yeah. is usually destructive, right? Like you, you usually lose things. You don't build on. Yeah. Well, uh, so, um, the thing that I would say is that it might be possible in principle. It'd be neat to see an experiment that would show <laughs> such a thing. That would be amazing. It's very speculative. I would be initially skeptical about it for two reasons. One is you need to have copying fidelity such that the fidelity, uh, such that the error rate is lower than the inverse of the length. So if you have a hundred mer, a hundred uh, strands, then more or less you have to only have 1% error on that or else the changes are so fast you don't even have generations. There's nothing to select. So sure, you might have a handful that actually do have all your three prime, five prime linkages, but that won't get inherited to the next generation, um, even if there was some way to communicate that information. And the other reason I'm a bit skeptical is uh, I just don't know how you would communicate that information from the base to the sugar. Um, but if you mm -hmm. could, and if you could get to really, really high accuracy copying, then yes, functionality would probably start to favor those. And then you'd have this really cool sort of evolutionary arms race and you'd get all three prime, five prime linkages. That'd be incredible. It'd be amazing if someone would discover something like that. All right. Well, anyone watching this that wants to do that, go be my <laughs> guest. <laughs> all right. Uh, four more questions and then we'll close out the stream. So unapologetic apologetics. Dr. Tour didn't choose the debate title. Oh, sorry. I missed the second part of the, the, the previous guy's question. He was talking about the, the paper being introduced against their agreement. So okay. that's nothing. That, yeah. We, we not, not, not really much for us to comment on, on that on. If they did that, then whatever. All right. Uh, Dr. Tour didn't choose the debate title. Instead, Farina insisted that the title be, are we clueless about, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That's disappointing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, maybe he thought that he could defend the claim that we're not clueless, but then I think they should have put their philosophy hats on and define what they mean by clueless. Like Dave didn't even attempt to do that. If he, if he did, at least from from my listening through it a couple of times, I didn't hear him define clueless at all throughout the whole thing. So if he if he had done that, then maybe it would have maybe I mean he he could have won the debate like that. But I think he was he was mainly focused on focused on discrediting Tour's character. He was like that was his main goal. So he didn't really care about the winning the actual substance or I don't know. All right, all right, let's move on. Rock in woodworks question: What is Professor D? Toxic or professional with people? What? I'm not sure what this. What? What is Professor Dave's toxic or professional with people? I don't understand what that is. I what that question is can't asking. Address that because I don't comprehend it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Next one from Blamtastic Full. It seems when Dave's intention was to show that James purposely misrepresented the scientific community, does he or is this claim completely baseless? I cannot read Dave's mind. All I can say is that there were some errors. Um, well, no, I think he's asking, does does uh, Jim Tour purposely misrepresent the scientific community? Oh, oh, I see. Oh, as far as I know, Jim Tour has never purposefully misrepresented this. Um, again, I can't read Jim Tour's mind either. It, it turns out yeah. neither of their minds can I read. Um, I do think that there are some places where the research does get misrepresented some, sometimes because, uh, Jim gets very, very excited. And so he'll overstate mm -hmm. a little bit sometimes, sometimes because he is an outsider in this field and, um, uh, he will misread certain things or he has a particular philosophical approach to the problem, which is very different from people who work in origins. Um, and, and so some of his criticisms miss in that sense, but whenever he's talking about the chemistry itself. Uh, usually he's pretty, pretty accurate, um, at least as far as I can tell. And he, he would actually be a, um, a more informed person to, to talk about the chemistry than I would in terms of the actual, actual organic and synthetic chemistry. All right, let's do the last question. And in this one, I'm, I'm really curious to get your thoughts on as a Christian theist, someone who is also working in origins. Uh, how do you get life from non-life without intelligent minds? And then he just says the probability seems really low. Yes. So I'm going to give a maybe somewhat unsatisfying, but very philosophical or theological answer to this is I don't think you can get life without an intelligent mind because I don't think you can get chemistry without an intelligent mind. I don't think you can get physics or a universe without an intelligent mind. So you will have nothing there. 
Um, you need an intelligent mind. I believe that God creates and sustains the universe and its existence every step along the way. And I think that God is active in ways that uh, sometimes we can explain and sometimes we can't. Um, even from the formation of a snowflake, from the birth of my child, all the way to the resurrection, some of these are easier for us to handle. And some of these uh, we will never really have a good explanation for. But I don't like basing the sort of difficulty of explaining things on whether something's natural or supernatural, mind or not mind. Everything's mind. Um, everything involves God. And I don't think we would have anything without that. Nice. All right. I think that's going to do it for us today. This Great. has been a lot of fun. And Paul, I need to have you yeah. back on the show. Like we need to, we need to do some more stuff together. What, what other sure. topics do you work on? I mean, this, this is be relevant for, for people that, that are interested in learning more about you as well. Like, is it just origins of life? Are you more interested? Are, are there any like theistic arguments that you like? Oh, sure. So, so um, uh, just very, very briefly. Um, so I'm a scientist. So professionally, what I do is science. Uh, the, the aspect of origins that I work on actually doesn't have a lot to do with what we talked about because it's a little too complex for what I deal with. I deal with how to make those amino acids in the first place and how the speed of the chemistry all works out. I also work on Venus um, and some biosignature stuff that's for work life on Venus. there in the universe. It must be hot. Um, in terms of philosophical and theological collaborations, um, I've been collaborating with uh, Andrew Davison, who is a uh, theologian. He is a professor here um, at Cambridge, and we're working on how you would quantify aliveness and the connection between aliveness and maybe some sort of... Uh, um, some sort of goal directedness involved with some of this kind of stuff and whether you can make sense of that in a scientifically respectable way. Um, and then in my free time, I enjoy Dungeons and Dragons games and uh, playing with my kids and being outside. I love reading philosophy, but I will be honest, it's, uh, um, it's probably like with you in chemistry. There's just a lot I don't understand, but I sure like reading like Peter Van and Wagen's book on material beings and various other things. And I, I like talking about it, but it's more like beer conversation. I, I'm not developing any new and great ideas there. <laughs> you, you said, uh, while you were talking, you said that you worked on Venus and I made a dad joke while you were talking. And I don't think you heard it. I said, Oh, you work on Venus. It must be hot. Oh, <laughs> That research is so hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, that was funny. Yeah. Well, no, Paul. It, yeah, it was, it was great to have you on. And um, may, I mean, it, it'd be fun. It, and I'll talk to you this, uh, talk to you about this after the stream. But maybe we could even have a chat with with you and Doctor Tour. Like, I'm sure that he would he would be at open. At some to point, it. I think that could be good. Um, I'm not sure if right now that would be so productive. But at some point, uh, Jim and I have um, corresponded. Um, I consider him on a certain level to be a sort of mentor in terms of scientific development. Uh, we disagree so strongly on some of this stuff and it's gotten so heated right now that I'm not sure where we would get with this, but if there was something useful and productive we could talk about, I, I would be open to it. Excellent. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me. What, what time is it over there now? It's probably what, uh, 10 o'clock it's about 10. In on, on 10 PM. Nice. Yeah. Well, um, enjoy the rest of your night. I'm sure your kids are probably already asleep. Well, maybe no, you're, you have an 11 year old. Is that right? I have an 11 year old and a 13 year old and the 13 year old, especially is a night owl. So, okay. Yeah. I was going to say like, uh, we, our kids are five and seven, so they are oh. in bed by like eight o'clock every day. That's awesome. So <laughs> it's going to be nice as, uh, yeah, as long as it lasts, but then it's, uh, it's not gonna At least they stay awake independently, more or less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks again for, for joining me. My pleasure. All right. Well, let me let you guys know again. Well, I, I didn't mention this earlier, so I, I shouldn't say again. But if you like this content, if you want to support Capturing Christianity, you can do that at patreon.com slash Capturing Christianity. Links to that are in the description of this video. This is a completely crowdfunded ministry. Capturing Christianity does literally not exist without your support. We are in need of your support right now. If you can support us, go to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. We give a lot of things in return for any amount that you give. Go check them all out. We actually have uh, something coming up soon. We do a monthly two-hour Zoom meeting with uh, patrons at the T3, I believe, tier on Patreon. So if you'd like to join that, become part of the conversation, hang out, talk about whatever you want to talk about, you can do that. Um, and again, just, just head over to our Patreon, check out all the different things that we have in return 
for your helping out our ministry, making sure that we are able to continue producing these these videos, commentary on apologetics and philosophy, interfaith dialogues, debates, all that stuff. If you want to continue to see, or if you want to help make sure that this content continues to be produced, then uh, support us. Go to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you guys in the next capturing Christianity video uh, as usual very soon. So see you guys soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?